you have your Bibles, perhaps we can open them together in the book of Ephesians, and we are in chapter number 3, Ephesians and chapter number 3. And let's read together from verse number 1, and uh, we're in the, the first kind of section here. So Ephesians chapter number 3, and reading please from verse number one, which says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's just bow our heads, shall we, and ask for God's blessing. Our Father, we do come into thy presence again this evening with thanksgiving. We thank thee for the word of God, and we know, Father, that it is indeed living and powerful, and we Pray, Father, that as we would just meditate upon it, uh, that thou would again feed our soul and open up our hearts to thy word. And we pray, Father, uh, that uh, thou would really speak to us in a personal way. We know, our Father, there is so much here uh, in these verses. And we pray, Father, that we would be encouraged together to have a glimpse of the Lord Jesus and just to see the joy and the glory and the riches that flow from this experience of Paul in the prison. So be with us, our Father, we pray, as we would wait upon thee, asking for thy help. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, we did notice uh, last time that in Ephesians chapter number 3, that in a sense we are uh, in that place that is, is a very strange place. It's a place that is is a prison. We notice that, of course, in verse number one, uh, Paul is very much in prison. And yet, within that prison cell, we get a glimpse of something that perhaps we might not expect to have a glimpse of. There at the centre, if you were able just to look past Paul and look past the prison bars, uh, verse number eight, you would see unsearchable riches. And so this, this place here of Ephesians 3 is both a prison cell and it is also a treasure house. It is a bit like, if you like, the Tower of London uh, down there, uh, just uh, south of the border, uh, just to the southern tip of Scotland. You remember there is that big city called London, uh, and, and within that city uh, there is uh, there is a tower, uh, very, uh, of course, uh, imaginatively called the Tower of London, uh, and and that once was a prison, but now. Uh, it is a treasure house. And that, in a sense, is where we are here in Ephesians chapter number 3, in a place that is both a prison and it is uh, a treasure house. Now, I think even just on the surface of Ephesians 3, there are encouraging things there for us. You know, I, I, I think if, if it was me here, uh, I'd been put in the place that Paul is, in that prison, with all of the things and all of the demands that have been placed upon him. He, you remember the commandment, the, the call that God had given to him in Acts chapter number 9 to go out there and evangelize the Western world. What a, what a call it was. I, as I remember, there were 12 disciples, that right? Or 12 apostles. Uh, 11 of them seemed to be focused in and around Jerusalem. And one was left with the rest of the world. The apostle Paul was left with the rest of the world, with you and me here in New Cumnock. 
And yet, there, despite having 250 million people to preach to world population at the time, there he is behind bars, surely frustrated, maybe even resentful. But can I just highlight the way that he opens up there in verse number 8? There is no sense of resentment with the Apostle Paul. It's not that the Apostle regards that God owes him an easy life or a smooth passage or an easy time. But as he's there in the prison, persecuted and restricted and constrained, verse number 8, his perspective on his own suffering, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given. God doesn't owe him anything. Everything he has, he has already received from the Lord, and he receives it in grace. Now, this prison cell is a remarkable place, like many prison cells that you will find through the word of God. It's a place where you can see God's sovereign hand. And by that, of course, I mean that God does what he will, when he will, why he wills. And in this prison cell, we see that God is fulfilling his purpose. A bit like, do you remember, back there in the book of Genesis, where we have Joseph in the prison cell. And it's from that prison cell that the slave becomes a prophet. It had real purpose in Joseph's life. Or maybe like that prison cell that you have in the life of Daniel. I'm thinking of the, of the den of lions sealed there with a stone. It's in that prison cell he becomes a wonderful picture of Christ. There in death, burial and resurrection. It's also, do you remember, the prison cell where we find that Onesimus uh, turns, he changes, doesn't he? From a slave to a saint, what a transformation. But through the prison cell, and you remember too, there back in Acts of the Apostles, that it's in the prison cell that God achieves his work, performs his work in Philippi, establishing his church through the preaching of the gospel. Listen, maybe you and I at times, we can look at our lives and we can see that maybe we're in, in a place that we would not choose to be. And that might be right. And we might, we might kind of regard it in a sense as, as, a, as a prison cell prison cell. Maybe we feel that, that, that we've been forgotten about. Maybe it's a dark place, a discouraging place, maybe a lonely place. Maybe a place where we only feel really the, the rejection of the Lord Jesus, as we'll see in a minute or two. But can we be encouraged, as the Apostle Paul here might encourage us in verse number one of Ephesians chapter three, that as he is there a prisoner, he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. The word order is different in the Greek than in the authorised text, if you're following the authorised text as I am. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Swap the words. And that word Christ, of course, brings us into the Old Testament truth of the Messiah, the one who's king. So as the apostle is there in his prison, yeah, sure he can see that, that there is a king in Rome, there's Caesar, and, and he's in the charge. In a sense, he's responsible for his imprisonment. And he can see that there's a high priest in Jerusalem. In a sense, he's responsible as well for his imprisonment. But above all of the kings of this world, there is Christ, and he's sovereign, and he's in control, and he will perform his purpose uh, by his own means. And we noticed in the past, of course, that perhaps it is because we have Ephesians, uh, but because we have the prison cell, that we have the Ephesian letter and those five great uh, prison epistles, because he's in prison. You have the Ephesian epistle, the Philippian epistle, the Colossian epistle, Second Timothy, and uh, Philemon. Somebody asked me after last week's meeting uh, if those were the only five letters that Paul wrote. No, what I mean is those were the only five he wrote in prison. But we have them because he wrote. Uh, he was there in prison. Five great epistles and four churches that were encouraged because he was there in prison. And of course, from it, these three great presentations of the person of the Lord Jesus. Let me just remind you of them very briefly this evening. So the first of all, of course, as the apostle is there in prison, he will speak to us. Do you notice verse number two uh, of the dispensation of grace? If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. And secondly, he'll speak of the mysteries. Verse number four. Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And thirdly, you'll notice in verse number eight, he will speak of the unsearchable riches of Christ. So in this prison cell, what we're really doing is we're going into that treasure house. Uh, we're going into that Tower of London and we're going to get a glimpse of the tremendous riches that are there for us in the Lord Jesus. And first of all, we take this great 
uh, this great uh, broad uh, uh, panoramic view of the purposes of God. And that word we use, or the word that the Apostle Paul uses, dispensation, verse number 2. It's that panorama of the way that God dispenses his grace, the way that he deals with this world from the beginning to the end. And we see that he deals with the world in different ways at different times. The word here, of course, is a dispensation of grace. So in, uh, uh, from the beginning of the New Testament right until today, God works with this world in terms of grace. And he, he extends his kindness. He extends his forgiveness. He offers salvation to all peoples in all places. He didn't always do that. You'll know that under the dispensation of law, only the Jews would really hear about Jehovah. And under the dispensation of law, a man that broke those laws would be put to death. But this is the dispensation of grace. And as God works through those dispensations, he does it for a purpose. He does it for the glory of his son. And the dispensation of the law of the Old Testament, that law, you remember, is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It's that dispensation of grace. It's that law that tells us that we've fallen short of his standard. And you go down through those commandments and you say that you draw the conclusion with the Apostle Paul. That by the law shall no flesh be right before God. It's by the law that we know we're sinners. And if we know we're sinners, having stolen, having, having blasphemed, having envied, having hated. If we know that we're sinners, we need a saviour. And that draws me to Christ. And of course... This great dispensation of grace presents the fullness of the Lord Jesus. And then he speaks about these wonderful mysteries. Uh, now we, we spoke about them in somewhat detail last week. I'm not going to repeat them, but there are, I would regard, 14 of these New Testament mysteries. And three great mysteries, or two great mysteries and a mystery of a great thing. And, and these are wonderful truths to see in the Word of God. You know, when I was younger, folks used to come and they would preach and they would tell us about these mysteries, the New Testament mysteries. And they would tell us that the mysteries are truths once concealed and now revealed. Maybe you've heard that. It's not really a definition of mysteries. It's just a feature of one or, one or two of the mysteries or some of the mysteries. Most of the mysteries, actually. It's a feature of them, but it's not really a definition of them. Um, because uh, uh, what we have in these wonderful mysteries, if you look at them, is something far more than just truth that was once hidden and is now revealed. But you look at them, you, you consider, for example, those, those three greats. Two great mysteries and one mystery of a great thing. Let me remind you of them. If you were in Ephesians, why don't we just flick over to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. So Paul is unfolding these unsearchable riches of Christ. And if you were to go through from Matthew to the end, to Revelation, you would find 14 of the mysteries. Most of them are in Paul's letters. And uh, uniquely amongst the 14, there are these three greats. So Ephesians 5.32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And that, remember, in Ephesians 5, is a section that deals with the Lord Jesus and the church as the bride, and the Lord Jesus as the bridegroom. So we've got that relationship between Christ and his people, and that's a great mystery, Ephesians 5. And then you come over with me, would you, to 1 Timothy 3.16. You've got the second great mystery, 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16. So there's 14 of the mysteries, but three of them are linked with great, two great mysteries and the mystery of a great thing. 1 Timothy 3.16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. No doubt what that great mystery is about. That's about the person of the Lord Jesus, isn't it? It's about his incarnation. It's about his revelation. It's about his ascension and by implication his crucifixion. And it's about his glorification. It's all about Christ. 1 Timothy 3.16. And then over, please, finally, to Revelation 17. And this is the mystery of a great thing. The mystery of a great thing. Revelation chapter 17, final book of our Bible, of course. And verse number 5. Uh, Revelation 17, verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And Babylon, of course, will be that final organised system in the world 
that Christ ultimately will remove. It's the final organised system of rebellion. It would seem to have religious overtones. It would seem to have economic overtones. It would seem to have overtones of entertainment as well. Uh, banking overtones. It's some massive world system. I think unlike anything we've actually seen, but probably bringing a number of threads together of things that may already be in existence. But that is going to be ultimately and finally removed. Now, here's the thing. What are these mysteries? What are these mysteries? Well, you put those three together, okay? <laughs> Let me just reorder them. 1 Timothy 3.16, the great mystery of godliness. That's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. His revelation, his incarnation, his ascension and resurrection, his exaltation and glorification. Number two. The great mystery of the church in Ephesians chapter number 5. That is Christ and his people together. God is redeeming a people and bringing them into an eternal relationship with himself. And number 3, the mystery of a great thing. Babylon the great. Revelation 17. Finally and fully God will remove everything that rejects and rebels against himself. The system and those responsible for the system who of course also are the Antichrist, the false prophet, the dragon and Satan. Now, if I was to ask you to summarise the message of the Bible for me, um, I wonder what you would come up with. Over the years people have tried. They've come up with big books, <laughs> big books, and if you've ever, ever bought books that summarise the message of the Bible, I suspect you will, you will appreciate big books. Uh, systematic theologies, they call them. Usually they run to multiple volumes, summarising the Bible. But if I was to ask Robert maybe to summarise it, not, not in big books, but how about in, in three points? I wonder how we would do <laughs> three points. Eh? It's a lot to ask, isn't it? I, you know, I, I don't think you would do much better than those three points in summarising the message of the Bible. That is, that God's purpose for this universe, his message for you and I in the word of God is, number one, the revelation, glorification, and presentation of his son, Jesus Christ. It's all about the glory of Christ. And Ephesians 1 opens like that, actually. Number two, the purpose of God in this world is to redeem a people who are lost, who are dead in trespasses and sins, and bring them out of this lost world into a relationship that lasts forever with his son. That's what he's doing today, isn't it? And number three, finally, God's ultimate and final part of that purpose and picture is to remove all that is in rebellion against himself. That's a pretty good summary, I would suggest to you, of the Bible in three points. I think you might struggle to, to, do, to do better, even though it's my message. I still think you would you probably struggle to do better than get those three points. Just three points to summarise the message of the Bible. So what are the mysteries? Truth once concealed, now revealed? No, 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 no. The mysteries that we have in the word of God is God's eternal purpose for this universe. Just below the surface of all the chaos we see in the Middle East of Iran attacking Israel and presumably Israel will retaliate and, and all of the murder that's going on there and, and all of the wars there in, in Eastern Europe and Putin rising and, and, and all of the instability in the world and all of the cruelty in, in our own land. All of those things on the surface seem to say it's out of control. If we just peel away the surface and we look underneath at what God is ultimately doing and will achieve, he will achieve these three things. First of all, the exaltation and glorification of his son. Secondly, the salvation of men and women redeemed from a fallen world, brought into an eternal relationship with him. And number three, the removal of all that re rejects and rebels against him. That is the purpose of God. And those are the mysteries. And the other 14 hang on those three. And we looked at them last week, so we won't go over them again uh, this evening. And then thirdly, we're going to look at the details. So in a sense, you see, Ephesians 3 begins with the big picture. And we look at the dispensations of what God is doing right the way through uh, time. And then we're looking at how he does it in the mysteries. And then we're looking at who it's all about in these unsearchable riches. Verse number 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints... Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ? You do just notice, by the way, on the surface, I think this is a challenge if you're involved in preaching. It's a challenge for me. 
Notice the way that, that Paul preaches the gospel. That was interesting. You see, you might just look at verse 8 and you say, well, what's Paul doing here in verse 8 is he speaks about the unsearchable riches of, of Christ. Is, is that material that he's only wanting to share with Christians? Well, he's going to share it with the Gentiles. Well, that maybe sounds maybe not just like Christians. Is that maybe non-Christians? I think it might be. And, and your, your suspicion would be confirmed if you look at that word preach. It's the word evangelize. Isn't that interesting? That as Paul goes out into the world and he shares the message of the gospel, he's not going to do it in a kind of, oh, a kind of cheap way or a kind of standard way or, or in a kind of a superficial way. He's going to preach the glories of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you get a glimpse of that through the Acts of the Apostles, don't you? As the Apostles, as well as, as Paul, they, they take, for example, the Old Testament pictures and the Old Testament prophecies and they present the Lord Jesus Christ as a fulfillment of those prophecies. They have a real deep understanding of the Word of God and they present that to many women. They don't treat them like idiots. Interesting. I've shared before, you know, the course that I went on many years ago as a student, you know. Uh, I was a student at the time and they took us away in this course it was quite nice, it was beside Loch Lomond but that was about the most positive thing I could say about the course to <laughs> and uh, the man got up and he told us how to preach the gospel oh, that's interesting he said, oh, what you need to do when you preach the gospel is four points he said, God, man, God, what if you don't do, what if you don't five points actually God, man, God, what if you do, what if you don't well, that was his message of the gospel there's a God that made you there's a man that fell, that's you and I. God who, who, who died on the cross, or the Lord Jesus who died on the cross. What if you accept him, what if you don't? A kind of standard gospel message. I, I don't read that in the Bible. I read the glories of Christ being presented, who the Saviour is and what he's done. And the Spirit of God taking that up and applying it to hearts. I read of men and women that get a glimpse of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ calling Lazarus come forth. And my, that changes the life. Or a woman at the well who's thirsty and empty and she gets a taste of living water. Or a man that's in darkness and, and he gets a, a glimpse of the glorious light that shines in that he's never seen before. And it's all fresh, it's all new, it's all living, it's all alive. There's nothing dead or stereotypical in it. And, and here, the Apostle Paul isn't just sharing these wonderful riches with, with you and I, but this is the way he presents the gospel. It's all about the glory of the person of the Lord Jesus. Because, you know, salvation doesn't come by ticking boxes. It comes by appreciating and resting in a person. That's what the Saviour means, isn't it? I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's not ticking boxes. It's about resting in the person of the Lord Jesus. Anyway, that's interesting. Verse number 8, he's going to speak to us about the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable riches riches of Christ. What does that mean? Unsearchable riches of Christ. I suppose the first time I read that I wondered if maybe it was a reference to all the things the Lord Jesus Christ has. Because that's how I think about it when I think about riches, things that we possess. And certainly as you go through the word of God you would find that the Lord Jesus Christ is in possession of many things. Uh, he is, of course, in the book of Psalms, the, uh, he has the cattle on the thousand hills, you remember that? At the end of Matthew's gospel, all power, all authority is given unto me. You remember too in John's gospel that he would tell his disciples that all that the Father has is, is his. Or what about John chapter number one? This whole universe by creation is his. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Is that what we're talking about here? The unsearchable riches of Christ. I don't think so. I don't think so. In our everyday language, we, we maybe speak about riches, and as we think about riches, perhaps like myself, your mind would go to things that there would be some value attached to. Maybe some value because there was an exceptional beauty about them. You know? Or maybe some particularly outstanding artistic thing that, that's attached to it. Or maybe because of some uh, scarcity, you know, your diamonds, your precious stones, they would have absolute value. There's a little verse that's interesting in the book of Hebrews. Can I take you to it? 
There is another kind of riches. Let me go over to Hebrews chapter number 11. A different kind of riches, maybe from things of artistic value or technical uh, standard or because of uh, scarcity. But let me show you something in Hebrews 11. <coughs> Hebrews number 11. It's down there at verse number 24. Some of you may have seen uh, films such as Schindler's List or The Pianist and uh, or maybe you've seen documentaries on the Holocaust and you, you might remember some of the stories uh, of the Jews being transported across Poland uh, to Auschwitz and Treblinka. And of course the story told to them was that they were going to be resettled in the East and they were to pack a case of 25 kilograms and take all their valuables with them. And, and what they did was they took their most valuable things. They had diamonds sewn into their clothes, they took their gold, they took their their Swiss watches and everything that was of relative value in this world. But on those cattle trains, they were given nothing to eat, nothing to drink. And perhaps you've seen and heard the stories that as they stopped at the different stations on route to Treblinka and Auschwitz, that they would take their most valuable possessions and just try and squeeze them through the slats in the wood of the cattle trucks just to swap them for a drink of water. A drink of water. You see, there are riches that go beyond just the material things that we have. There are those riches that are riches because they're absolutely essential things. Essential things that go beyond the relative value of material things. Things that are utterly essential. That when push comes to shove, you would swap all that you had just for that glass of water because water is utterly essential. Let me show you that truth here in Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews 11. Verse number 24. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect to the recompense of the reward. So Moses had everything this world could give him. Verse 24, he had place, he was the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he had position and power, he had pleasure in verse number 25 of Hebrews 11 to enjoy the pleasures of sin, and he had possessions, riches and treasures in Egypt, verse number 26, and yet he took that place, position, power, pleasures, uh, and, and, and he was willing to swap it. For something he found in Christ. Something that he regarded as greater value than anything material in this world. This had absolute value. Now, when we come to Ephesians chapter number 3 and we find these unsearchable riches in Christ, we have a clue as to what the Apostle Paul means. Did you notice that in verse number 8? I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, if you were to go through his epistles, you wouldn't find the, the, the unsearchable riches of Christ as the things that Christ possesses. But as you go through his epistles, you would find that what dominates those epistles is the person and work of the Lord Jesus. As you go through the book of Romans, for example, it is full of the salvation work of Jesus Christ. The work in which he shed his blood in the, uh, as a sacrifice for my sin upon the mercy seat of Romans chapter 3. A work in which he saves and sanctifies in Romans 6. In 1 Corinthians, you would find the, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his purity. Christ our Passover sacrificed for us. In Galatians, you would find his gospel work. Uh, in, uh, in, in Ephesians, you would find his work in the church. In Philippians, you would find his mind. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. So right the way through the epistles, you find the character of Christ, the work of Christ. And the Apostle Paul presents these tremendous riches. Now, here's something that greatly encouraged my heart as I looked at this verse. Unsearchable riches of Christ. In those verses that we read in Hebrews 11, there is a man that helps me to understand the true value of those riches. And he's someone I wouldn't have expected 
to teach me the true values of the riches of Christ. It's Moses. I wouldn't have expected Moses to teach me about the true riches of Christ. There was something that always puzzled me about those verses in Hebrews 11 as I read them in years gone by. But I think I might just know what it means now. Did you notice that as Moses leaves behind all of the place, the position, the power, the pleasures and possessions, and he goes out, it says in verse 26 of Hebrews 11 that he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Interesting. He wasn't thinking so much about the glory of heaven as greater riches than that of Egypt. Or maybe spiritual gifts, which Ephesians speaks about, as greater riches than anything you can have in heaven. Or even the salvation of your soul as greater riches than anything you could get in Egypt. But rather, Moses grasps this, that even if all I have or all I feel I have of Christ, is his reproach. If even all I feel that I can taste of the Lord Jesus is his tears, if all that touches me of Christ are the nail prints from his cross, or if all that I have of the Saviour is the burden that I carry in his cross, if that is all that I have of Christ, that is greater than anything I could possibly have in the world. Does that not put the riches into perspective? And of course, you and I know we have infinitely more than that. But there are times, are there not? Times when we feel that maybe that's all we have. That the world is against us, and actually it often is. And maybe we feel, we feel the emptiness, or, or maybe we feel the persecution. Or, or maybe we don't see much light at the end of the tunnel, and maybe we get discouraged. We get bitterly discouraged in the world, or maybe bitterly discouraged in Christian work, or even discouraged with our families at times, or even discouraged by ourselves and our own failure. And all we feel that we have are the insults that were thrown at the Lord Jesus, and the spittle that was put on the Lord Jesus, and the beatings that were given to the Lord Jesus. And it seems that at this moment in time, that's all that I can identify with. Listen, here's what Moses says. Even that reproach is better than the rest of the world. I think that's a tremendous perspective on those wonderful uh, riches of Christ. Unsearchable riches of Christ. Not what he possesses, but who he is and what he does. Let me remind you that your saviour is the bread of life. He's the one who satisfies the hungry soul. Let me remind you that he's the living water. He satisfies the thirsty soul. Let me remind you that your saviour is the light of the world. And that, of course, in the setting of the blind man into his darkness on that light. He's the shepherd of his sheep when we need guidance. He's the door into heaven where one day we will enter. And as we go towards that place, he is the way. In a world of confusion... And there is plenty of that in the last 20 years. In a world of confusion, he is the truth. The truth. Let me remind you, in those moments when we feel discouraged and in despair, he is our comforter, as is the Holy Spirit, but so too the Lord Jesus. And let me remind you, when there is no strength and you need it from heaven, and yet heaven seems such a long way away, he is your great high priest. And let me remind you, when you sometimes think that there is a God in heaven who is so different from you, a holy, harmless, spotless God in heaven who is omniscient, omnipotent and omnipresent and he seems a million miles away from you, let me remind you that you have in heaven a man who is touched by the feelings of our infirmity and who understands everything that we go through and who makes intercession for us. Let me remind you too, that it was to David, as he faced Goliath, that he knew that title of the Lord, the Lord of hosts. He knew who was at his back. We sometimes are impressed, aren't we, that a young uh, shepherd boy should go up against Goliath. Well, he didn't, actually. It was a young shepherd boy and God that went up against Goliath. And David, by the way, was pretty clear on that one. Pretty clear on that one. Let me remind you, too, that 
It was to Abraham in his need of provision of a lamb that he discovered Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. It was also, of course, Gideon having seen the angel of the Lord and utterly petrified that he would die because no flesh can see God and live and he had seen the angel of the Lord and it was to Gideon that he knew Jehovah Shalom, the Lord my peace. You see, in every experience of the Christian life, we have these wonderful riches of the Lord Jesus Christ, all sufficient in our every need, in our every need. What a great saviour we have, uh, wonderful riches. And to me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, riches without end. And we notice that this, of course, is in the prison. Verse number one, we highlighted it, I think, last time. <coughs> this is in the prison. But maybe you would agree with me, and maybe you would agree with the Apostle Paul. But this section that begins with the prison, verse number one, for this cause I, Paul the prisoner, ends in verse number 11, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. I wonder if you would agree with me, and perhaps agree with the Apostle Paul, uh, that that prison... Uh, has a purpose. It begins with prison. It ends with purpose. And out of that prison comes the glories of the Lord Jesus. You see, the apostle had that appreciation right at the very beginning. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. His God was sovereign over the prison. Christ, Messiah, King. And he was also the saviour in the prison. There he was, shut off alone with the Lord Jesus. And so maybe no surprise to us as we listen to the words of the Apostle Paul, as he's shut off from this world, in that prison cell, alone with the Lord Jesus Christ, that out of that prison comes this wonderful ministry of the Lord Jesus. It's just full of Christ, isn't it? It's full of Christ. It's full of Christ as he looks at what God is going to, going to do over the whole panorama of history, uh, as he looks at what God is doing uh, through his Son in these mysteries. And as we see here in verse 8, what he does in revealing his Son in these wonderful unsearchable riches of Christ. Let's pray. pray. Our Father, we do come into thy presence uh, this evening with thanksgiving. We thank thee for the Lord Jesus. We thank thee, our Father, that we have in Christ these unsearchable riches. Uh, we thank thee, our Father, that thou art a God who is sovereign over the problems and difficulties of life. Uh, and we thank thee, our Father, that in being sovereign over experiences such as this prison, that thou art a God that brings out the glory of thy Son. We thank thee, our Father, that from that prison cell in which Paul was constrained, we get a flavour of the wonderful riches of the Lord Jesus. We thank thee, our Father, for that value that is attached to the Lord Jesus. We remember our Father, a man who had everything, Moses, we remember a man who had placed position, power, possessions and pleasure in this world and yet uh, chose rather the reproach of Christ as greater riches. Uh, 